Welcome to the Awe and Wonder Podcast. Season 5 is all about vision and AAC. I'm Sarah Kinsella. And I'm Brenda Del Monte. And today we're joined by Whitney Van Klinken, who is a speech and language pathologist who specializes in AAC and has done that for about 13 years. She works for Multicare Yakima Memorial Hospital and sees both pediatric and adult patients in an outpatient setting. Welcome, Whitney. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So, um, Whitney, you and Brenda have similar positions in what you do as far as AAC evaluations for students. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah. So, um, like you said, I see children and adults, and I am our main AAC um, SLP um, for the hospital. I now have a few um two other um, SLPs, uh, a part of our AAC team, but I am I am the head and um, I am responsible mostly for all of the funding requests and getting um, AAC devices funded um, through medical insurance for my patients. Um, the, the gals who also um, work on our AAC team, they feel more comfortable doing um, more of the therapy um, and the impl- implementation, but I definitely... Um, The funding request is kind of my jam and I really like doing that. And um, I've pretty much perfected the letter of medical necessity over 13 years. And so haven't had any denials. And so, yeah, so that's um, my um, main responsibility. And and then of course, implementing it, um, collaborating with the school, making sure the patient obviously knows how to use it, the the family, um, caregivers, anyone who's involved. And then, um, yeah, see them for however many sessions to meet our goals. And then, um, I, I always kind of put them on hold, um, and instead of just discharging them that way, it, it's more comfortable for the parents. They feel like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to be gone, you know? And I, Mm -hmm. I always tell them I live here, I'm born and raised here. I'm not going anywhere. And so I'm always, this is, this is always what I'm going to be doing as AAC. And so I'm always there, but they feel a little more comfortable if I put them on hold and then we kind of can do like some consults and just um, keep it going. And then, and then eventually we can discharge, but I see, um, I get to see patients throughout their lifespan. I always, it's kind of morbid, but I say from birth to death, um, but I get to, and so I get to see patients for their second and third devices. And so I'm on, I'm on the third, I think so far with some of my um, very first patients. So yeah, that's Mm -hmm. kind of the the big explanation of of what I do and there's obviously other little things mixed in there but yeah that's that's mainly my specialty and what I do that's yeah. pretty special that you get to see your patients through multiple communication systems mm-hmm. and also that you say it's your jam that's awesome <laughs> um, <laughs> and for those who don't know where you are can you tell us a little bit about your area and population? Yeah, so Central Washington, um, and we're very close to Central Washington University, um, of course, in Ellensburg. And so a lot of people always like to think that we're on Eastern Washington. I'm like, we're right smack dab in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, but so Yakima County is fairly large. So I, I and I even see some um, patients out of county, just if they're in a more rural setting and they can't get to an outpatient clinic, they don't want to go to Seattle or they don't want to go all the way to Tri-Cities or Spokane. And so I, I feel like I have a really big radius of um, the people that I see. Um, but yeah, we're kind of, um, we're centrally located and we're getting bigger in our, I, I would say when I started, um, so I've been with Memorial for um, 11 years now. And uh, when I started, I did a like a half day of AAC and then I was doing early intervention. And then when I got to do full-time AAC, um, I didn't have a wait list. You know, it was like hard to build up my caseload and now, and now we're a team of three. So um, just goes to show you kind of um, how big it's getting and how more people are learning about AAC. Um, and more people mm-hmm. are getting diagnosed with things, you know, and so sure. um, it's more prevalent. So, right. Yeah. I have been in Arizona doing eva- AAC evaluations for 12 years. So similar timeline as far as just all AAC only pretty much, you know, and I do communication device evaluations in Arizona. The the service delivery model is when you get, you do an eval and when you get the device, you do four sessions of coaching. So it's great because I have some follow-up, right? And so it's, you know, t- training the schools, training uh, ongoing SLPs, training family. Um, but uh, since I'm 12 years in, I'm also on like round two or three. And we, as, as far as 
vision goes, that's been fascinating, right? Because I've started with kids with really, really low vision at birth of three, and we're doing switch access with auditory preview or things like that, um, where they're listening to their choices and hitting a switch when they hear the one they want, and we're really not taxing the visual system at all. And then I might come back in a few years and it's like, oh, their vision is so much better. And we now finally have the best classes and, you know, here's where we're at. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then even their access method will change when their vision changes. And sometimes it goes the other way. I also work with children with degenerative disorders and it's like we were doing eye gaze and now the, um, the eyes are degenerating. And so now we're switching over to switches. So the thing about being able to see people over time is seeing how that vision can change and how that changes access method. And just the only constant is change. I know when we did our data, at least 60% of the people who needed communication device evaluations reported some kind of visual difference. And by difference, I mean they're wearing glasses or maybe they have a prosthetic eye, but the other eye is 20-20. Or now the big one is CVI, which doesn't tell us a whole lot about anything at all other than we have to observe what that looks like in this person, right? What do you think is the percentage of people doing AAC evaluations, getting an AAC evaluation that has some sort of visual impairment or difference? Oh, at least I would say 25%. Okay. Um, just, yeah. And, and like you were highlighting like CVI and that is just, that's something I feel like I didn't hear about when I first started. It was just, Definitely not. yeah, they have, they have some issues, but we're not sure, you know, the acuity or the extent to it. Um, and now that's a big one. And so I, you know, as AAC SLPs, we're constantly having to learn as is because technology mm -hmm. every single day is completely different, but then yeah. now throw in that piece of vision. And mm -hmm. now there's more, I feel like when I first started out, I didn't, you know, you hear of teachers of, you know, deaf of hard of hearing, but like, I feel like vision teachers, yeah, I'm sure they've been around, but like, I had never collaborated with them or consulted with them until, gosh, I, I want to say maybe five years ago. Um, and so it's just becoming more, um, you know, we're, we're knowing that, that their capabilities are so much more, I think, um, and back in the day of just kind of those assumptions that people would make of, yeah, I don't know that they are going to be an AAC user, right. definitely not high tech. Um, and so much of that is changed right. as technology changes. Right. Too. So do you, um, do you ever you work with um, a TBI or a, t a teacher visually impaired um, in the evaluation or is it mostly during the implementation? Mostly during the implementation. Um, funny you should say that because I have um, a little girl, a three-year-old, and I, at our next session, we're going to um, have her teacher um, Zoom in with us. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and we, she's just trialing devices right now. So I think this will be my first one that I get to kind of have throughout that evaluation um, and trial phase. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely always when we implement it, um, we want to make sure, like I said, collaboration with teachers. But yeah, I think this might be my first one that I finally get to like have more input of like, mm -hmm. it's not my specialty to know maybe what um, contrasting colors that, you know, that kiddo mm -hmm. responds the best to or her her depth of, you know, like mm -hmm. how close the device needs to be, things like that. So right. I think uh -huh. that's going to teach me a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes, sure. it's, sometimes it's that we don't know what we don't know, right? And mm -hmm. Now we know, oh, wow, there are people, you know, that we know there are, there are TVIs, there are people we need to collaborate with, there's OTs we need to collaborate with, and mm -hmm. physical therapists. Um, but when you learn about some of these things, like the uh, learning media assessment, and you start to see those things um, in the reports and, and collaborate more with TVIs, there's so much we can learn. Um, Brenda, what what's your collaboration with TVIs when you're doing AAC evaluations? So I get the paperwork and sometimes that's included, but I don't have consistent access to a vision specialist in any way. I have gone to, we have gone to schools and done evals and the, um, sometimes the, um, vision specialist is like a paraeducator that's had some training and sometimes it's a parent with a child of, um, a visual impairment. And other times it's somebody that's had a ton of schooling around it. So that's the other thing I think is the, um, 
there, it varies the expertise of the vision specialist regarding AAC in particular. And so it's great to collaborate, but I just feel like it's hard to get my hands on um, the ones that are working with them. And even my data recently, as we've been taking more, um, is like, well, to go in, well, to be talking, we, mo most of the evaluations are done at the homes for me. So I'm talking to the parent and I'll say, tell me about your child's vision. And they'll say, oh, you know, she has CVI. And I said, okay, what, what do you know? Do you, you know, do you have a level? Do you have a, what do you understand? And it, so much of the time it's like, no, I don't know. Right. And so the parent is the, is their reporter and they have not been adequately educated on the vision piece or they're like, it's variable, which is also true. So I feel like vision, I was, I've mentioned this in the other podcast too, too, is like, I feel like vision is literally like a, a fingerprint. Like, I don't think that any of us see that, see the world the same way. <laughs> I just don't. Are there some myths about people with low vision that you just think right off the bat, let's just myth bust these so that people come in with the right mindset? Well, yeah, even just not just low vision, but AAC itself, as we always hear it, it's just mm -hmm. like presume competence. So you just have to think, you know, yes, they can do it. So um, I always tell families and schools and things like people that I work with of just like, I'm going to start up here mm -hmm. and, and work up to it, you know, and help model and all these things versus no, we're going to start down here. And then it's so hard to just keep like, oh, let's up their user group. That's up their user group. But no, I would say, you know, just thinking someone with low vision, um, CVI or anything like that, like, oh, they can't use eye gaze. They can't use it at all. And so I, you know, I'm like, well, let's try. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's nice to be able to have those devices on hand to to show yeah. them physically right then and there that like, right. that's not necessarily um, something that means that they wouldn't be a good candidate for an IGA system. Um, you know, right. if they're, if they're completely blind, doesn't mean that they shouldn't use any technology, you know, I almost... Right. That's the complete opposite. And they're going to need right. to protect their whole life. Um, yeah. So, yeah, or like, um, and again, this is with AAC in general, but low vision when it comes to that is just needing that full, like full physical assist, you know, of just, yep, they're going to need, you know, say if they're using direct selection, you, you talked about, yeah, that's the other piece of like that hand-eye coordination. So like learning about prompting and like hand under hand is something that I've learned more about with like low vision because mm -hmm. I have this little girl that I'm working with right now. Um, so just, yeah, just assuming they're going to need a full assist, you know, instead of doing a prompting hierarchy. Um, a lot of those things, yes, just assuming, yes, that they are not a good candidate, assuming that they're not going to be competent just because they have, you know, something low in, in one area of their life. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Doesn't I tell like us the full story of that student. I feel like in, in, in particular, one of the things that um, we don't do with vision with kids with lower vision is um, we'll be like, we'll have success with like two or four choices or something. And then we won't move up because we've decided that their vision won't let them. And then when you try something, then, then, you know, a new set of eyes come along or um, you, ac they accidentally find themselves somewhere else and they can do way more than we thought. And motor planning still matters, even if it's eye gaze, you know, it's once they get to know things. So do you see that too, that it's, you feel like I, what, what's, what's hard for me is like, I'll go back to an eval, like, okay, we started at 15 buttons because the kid was two and that's where the, that's as small as they could converge on. And I come back four or five years later and they never, they've never progressed. This happens in all AAC, but I feel like with vision, it's more prominent. Do you see yeah. that too? I do. And it's like, this was almost a downfall of like an experience I had in the past of getting a very in-depth um, evaluation from a TBI was like, you get to see what all their levels are, maybe what their preferred colors are, their distance, their, yeah, their number of, uh, or like how big the symbols should mm -hmm. be. And then you feel like you're pigeonholing yourself in, into that, like, nope, this is mm -hmm. what we're going to be. And then, but like I said, I always try to kind of break out of that and just, we're going to start up here and we're going to work mm -hmm. up to that. And we, you know, and this is something that's hard with the AAC funding process too, is having to paint this picture of that they are completely independent. And some, some are not, I mean, like I didn't learn my first language in, you know, what was my child period recently with a, you know, three months, I, you know, and so 
just, I don't know if I'm answering that right, but just, um, you know, yeah. trying to not just, yes, get stuck on what you've been told is their abilities, um, what mm-hmm. they've shown you are your abilities and just being able to um, help get to that next stage um, with prompting mm-hmm. with, you know, other people um, giving their opinion. Environments are different. I mean, we mm-hmm. might be, you know, using only these few words in this environment, but then at home it's different. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, right. you can take it all into account for sure. Well, mm-hmm. and, and thinking about th- there can be a mismatch of the vision and the language and how do we balance that and how, for the student, for each student, which is a little different, which is why, like you said, when you read the report, um, and this is true from any of us, that if you just go on that report, you're not, you don't have the full picture, right? Having mm-hmm. that conversation can really help. And I think, um, yeah, the more that we can have those conversations together to say, well, you know, and I did have this experience of this one student, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Or, you know, what what this says doesn't mean only this, it, it, there's some variability in this. Um, but thinking about eye gaze systems, you, you talked about eye gaze, both of you for students who have CVI, what are things you need to think about for eye gaze with students with low vision or CVI? I just did an eval this week and um, the girl was, um, she was farsighted. She didn't have CVI diagnosis, but she was farsighted and doesn't tolerate her glasses, right? Because there's also this kind of thing. (laughs) But the great thing is, is since eye gaze has to be like 18 to 22 inches from your eyes, you're almost better off if they if their sight a little bit at distance is better than near 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 sighted cuz i've had kiddos that are very near sighted and they won't wear their glasses which means it has to be 3 inches from their face and actually then you can't do eye gaze um because you it it's distorted and you can't do it so one of the things to know about eye gaze is that distance piece and that's that's just the cameras are done that's the limitations of the camera that's that's where technology is at right now and they've gotten so much better over the years. It's exciting, but I, I'm sure we're still in our infancy and in, in eye gaze and that kind of thing. But that's the limitation of a camera. So it's like, if you know that, then you're looking at like what, it's not what can they, not just what can they see and what they can't see, but what can they see at the distance required for eye gaze? And uh-huh. it, does that mean that you're down to two, two choices? Then it's probably not the best access method, Right. But and you could have um, a device where you're listening to choices and and hitting a switch when you hear the one you want, and you could go up to a you know a column row or a sixteen grid or way more language, right? So you're trying to figure out um, is vision going to be the gatekeeper of this kid's language if I sign up for this access method? So one of them is that distance thing. I, I'm always going, I'm kind of looking at like, what can they see at that distance? And does that, does that hinder the language growth or it does that facilitate it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Position, like, as you're saying that, just all I always think about eye gaze or not is yeah, just positioning and what's the most comfortable and like, regardless of what the medical diagnosis is, like getting you in a good spot to be able to learn and get you regulated. And yeah, that's, that's always been, been really important. Like I said, eye gaze or not, but other things too, like I have patients who like, luckily at work, well, not luckily we have fluorescent lighting. And so, but in our treatment rooms where we have the ability to either have like three, all four on, three on or just one on. And so I have always tried to ask family, like, what have you noticed at home or what has like, yeah, teacher said, whether it's a, you know, teacher, a a TBI or just, you know, traditional and just like what has worked best. And so like being able to do some of those things as well. Um, And yeah, we've kind of hinted at it, but just like the collaboration with other disciplines, that's what's great about Children's Village is I can look outside my treatment room and spot a PT or an OT. And most Mm -hmm. of the patients that I see that have like multiple physical challenges, they're being seen by everyone else at the village anyway. And so um, we'll try to do some co-treats. We often have like the wheelchair vendor on site as well. So like, hey, do we need any modifications to their wheelchair or whatever system they're using? Mm -hmm. So that's always really big when thinking about evaluations and continuing therapy as well too. If you guys recommend an eye gaze system for a student, 
Um, and you said maybe, like you said, Brittany, you're trying it in an environment where the lights are dim or there are certain environmental things you're thinking about. Are you, either of you, expecting the student to use the eye gaze device with eye gaze throughout the whole day um, as their only method? Or tell me a little bit about that. I mean, I always want to have a backup method. I always want to have some type of like, yes, no response or just like, I got something to say, you know, um, I have an adult that I see who it's like raising her right arm of just like, yep, I got something to say because, and I always say this with eye gaze too. And I think it was like one of the reps way back in the day that said it. And it just like meant, oh, I like say it all the time now because it totally if we ourselves as typically, you know, I don't have any vision issues. I use eye gaze. Oh my gosh, I get tired so quick. So that eye is a muscle. And so it's just like physical therapy for our eyes. You know, we, um, you have to be able to take breaks. And so, yes, you need a backup method, whatever that looks like. And so lots of my patients who have gotten different systems over the years, almost always they started out with something that was low tech or no tech, you know, of being able to do partner assisted scanning with a pod book or um, with their switches, you know, and so not ever letting go of those because the eye gazing or eye gaze can be taxing regardless of whether or not you have vision issues. Um, Right. And there can be fatigue and then also just periods of their day where it's not convenient to have that available. Right. Um, Whitney, you talked about the pod book with partner assisted scanning. Can you just elaborate that on that a little bit? What does that mean? The pragmatic um, organization, dynamic display, communication, like notebook. Um, Yeah, gosh, did a training with Linda Burkhart. Must have been 10, 11 years ago by now. Um, Yeah, yeah. And we bought that system. I made Children's Village buy that system. We do pod books all the time. So one of the girls on my team um, itself, she really has um, liked pod. And so um, if I'm not able to see someone, because I mostly just do high tech and be able to get those funding requests and things. And so mm-hmm. she will be able to do um, pod books with our patients. And whether they are direct selecting or um, they're using partner assisted scanning. So what that means is their communication partner um, would be reading out loud their options. You know, you could go row column, column row, whatever they have decided is their easiest way to access it. And then they have a, yes, that's the one I want response. Um, Raising their hand, hitting a switch, whatever it looks like to be like, yes, that's the one I want, or that's the row that I want, keep going um, to make choices that way. Because yeah, especially with kids with multiple physical challenges or vision, being able to do high tech is not always, always the best for them. So, right. So that's a, the, so the pod book is a low tech paper book, but it's mm-hmm. robust. It has a lot of vocabulary. Yeah. And so language. that's that pra- pragmatic piece of it. Um, they get the very first page or it's, I want to say like page, I almost have it memorized. Like page two is where, yeah, it has those pragmatic branches of like, I want something. I have something to say. I I don't like this. And so it's dynamic in the fact of like our, you know, speech generating devices. You push something, you select something static. It doesn't stay on that screen. So it's very robust. Um, So maybe you have technology as a barrier to someone because of whatever reason, their physical challenges. And so being able to use something like that um, without a screen, but still providing that rich, robust language um, is a great option. So you may use that to supplement language or Mm -hmm. um, even receptive language too. Yeah. Even with the student who you're working with, um, high tech communication systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've, it's funny. I have now that like there's pod pages on, um, on like TD snap for say Mm -hmm. Toby Dynavok. Um, I have a patient who started off with like and it's so funny because she's one I have seen from Children's Village and now she's at my adult clinic and I have, this is her second device, but she started out with like 15 button pod book all the way up to, she has a hundred button pod book. That's still her backup method, but now she uses like the 60 button just because that's the highest they go, um, 60 button pod pages on her communication device. And I've seen this girl go from, she did joystick on her um, power wheelchair So then eye gaze and then eye gaze was too taxing and her body actually, she's gone through a lot of intensive therapies 
And uh, so now she's doing direct select on her 60 button pod book mm. without symbols. She went from symbols to now just words because she's in high school and she doesn't want to, you know, the least restrictive environment. She wants to look like her peers. And so it's just awesome to see just like how, you know, her language growth um, has increased along with her access and her, you know, all of it. So, yeah. And uh, what I like about that too, is kind of what Brenda mentioned is that you're also listening to the AAC user and what they want and what their preferences are. Like Brenda, I know you've talked a lot about um, AAC users you've had where they have a choice. Am I going to use my eyes? Am I going to use my switches or am I going to use some a low tech board? Yeah. I, for eye gaze users, I always have a, have a button where they can say, I want my low tech eye gaze board, because then that, that usually means I'm going to go do four symbols on a black background and it's in, we're going to get, we're just going to get some basic needs met. Right. Um, but I do have a boy who does eye gaze at school all day. And by the time he gets home, he's just done. And so he usually switches to um, switch access. He's on a smart box now and he'll switch to switch access um, in the evenings because again, it's, ba and, and he'll, he's on a 60 grid at school and he's has a basic needs one on 15 at home. Um, because he's just, it's routine based language. He needs, he needs phrases. He needs quick stuff and he's exhausted and his eyes physically are completely dilated by the evening. He, this is part of his eye condition. So at when they fatigue, the eyes dilate more and more and more. So, um, he does not want a big bright screen in front of his face. You know, if he's going to do switches, then, then fine. And even if it, even if it's not the high tech at all. So then the thing about switches is you can go like, Hey, you know, you can say, do you want, um, do you want to go to your bed? Do you want to watch some TV with us? Or do you want to listen to some music? And maybe those choices on the high tech aren't even on the same page mm -hmm. because when you go to music, then there's a whole bunch of music chess. And when you go to TV, there's a whole bunch, right. You go to location, there's a whole bunch of places. So it's like telling, asking them things that are not all on one page. But if you under if you have taught a student to um, hit the switch when they hear the one they want, and the, and there's that you hear that, right? You hit the switch when you hear the one you want. And the switch doesn't even have to be within eyesight, meaning it could be a head switch or something that they can tactily feel. Then um, you can provide verbal information low tech wise, meaning you're just giving them choices and they hit the switch when they hear the one you want and you get on with your life. And um, that meets a lot of needs of um, children with parents, children with low vision, with parents on the, um, you know, witching hour. I'm making dinner. You're getting your stuff done. You know, you're, you're, you seem cranky and I've got, I'm helping brother with algebra and sister needs a diaper change. So I'm going to, here we go. Hit, you, you hit the switch when you hear the one you want. And I have the switch maybe set, set to, that's the one or something, <laughs> something that's going to be super generic. Um, because the reality is, is like we need um, low and high tech for all kids, but um, with low vision and with all with variable vision, which is kind of what we see with CVI sometimes and some of these medically um, complex diagnoses, um, they they need to be able to have some control. So I have things that says I need my switches. I need my low tech eye gaze board. Um, the screen's too bright. Things around that where it's where they can. Um, can can they can control the way that they're communicating with you and so that's how you can avoid just complete shutdown which is close my eyes pretend that I'm sleeping and I feel like when I go into classrooms or it's like well she sleeps all the time I go man I doubt it I doubt she's really that tired and probably there's something about this environment that's that's um sensory overload let's identify it but having said that you know if if eye gaze only works in a dark, quiet room and they have three siblings and they go to public school, then eye gaze doesn't work. I mean, so the, you know, making sure that we're like assessing the realistic um, use of something because we can make an eye gaze work in within all of these perfect conditions and it's never simulated in real life. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, two things I want to touch on, like you talking about the parents, like that I love to give them credit because obviously they know their kids better than anyone. And so, sure. like you said, it's kind of like more basic needs and it's like, but that's okay. I think, I think that's okay for everyone involved. And, and I 
The second part of that is that I did start out doing some early intervention when I was at Children's Village. And so the the IFSP, the Individual Family Service Plan, like it is about in the home environment. So yeah. like you're saying, Brenda, like you have to know, okay, is this going to work for mom? Is this going to work for little sister? Is this, you know what I mean? So something that, mm-hmm. of course, patient first, kiddo first, who we're working with, but then is this realistic? And if it's not, then how do we make those accommodations? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you guys, um, like a student comes to you and ha- you have a report that says there's low vision or CVI and um, they they really truly can only handle maybe four cells on a screen. What do you look for? What do you do? Hmm. I, I kind of just like when they're not even using high tech, using switches, like it's uh, that this phrase just is always in my head. Yes, that's the one I want. Like mm-hmm. I need to see. So if it is ga- eye gaze, I need to see something more than just cause and effect. I mean, like, yes, we start off with if we're doing eye gaze, like let's try some sensory games, see if we can, you know, just activate the screen. Or is, it, is our positioning in a good spot? But I always like to see emotions involved I have so like this little girl it's funny we were starting out with four buttons on say TD snap um because that is just the device that we had in our possession and so what are those four choices it was music different musical instruments and then I could play them on my iPad so was she just selecting them at random probably to start with you know um because she does have CVI I want to say a level three um And so, but then is it, oh, and then she's looking at me. I need that secondary something that's like, that was it. Give it to me. The smile, you know, just reading that whole person, um, you know, are they getting more spastic because they're excited, you know, kind of just more than just, oh, it activated. Cool. Mm. Like, what does that mean? You know, that's kind of what I look for if I'm not exactly sure of cognition because, we're nonverbal, like how, do, how, you know, how have we tested that? We're only three, you know? So that's what I look for. I don't know if that's the most professional answer. Well, but. Uh, yeah, that observation is re- that you're saying the observation is really key, seeing the communicated b- behaviors and, and things like that, because you are presuming she can do, do this and she understands. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Brenda, yes. what about you? Well, I feel like when I first came to Arizona, there was some uh, around funding here because it's long it's long term care that does the funding for the devices here and and um there was a if they can only do four buttons on eye gaze then low tech is sufficient and so you it was a denial okay. so i'm always trying to do six minimum and grow from there, which on like a TD snap is like supported navigation. And then you get there for six buttons. Um, and so because I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it and know I'm getting denied. Um, but um, the, what what Wendy's talking about is, is the, the observational skills, the critical thinking skills involved in quote, evaluating someone's intention without testing it. And it's so tricky. So if you were to say find Apple and they didn't yes. look at Apple, then they're wrong, except for that they don't eat eat by mouth and they don't want the Apple. So then now we still don't even actually know if they want that, right? Because I did have someone, someone was told, look at, um, look at Mary Poppins and I'll play Supercalifragilistic or something. And then the girl never looked at it. And the mom was like, I told the evaluator, she hates that song. She doesn't like those movies. And the, it was a DNQ. They did not qualify her because she would not follow the directions. And I was like, man, let's, let's step back and, and talk about what that looks like. But when, but what Whitney's talking about is they pick, you know, they pick, um, I don't know, Raffy baby beluga, you play it, they light up and then they pick it again and you can go, okay. And then, or they pick something and they scowl and then when they never pick that one, the rest of the trial. So it's like, they look at it, they hear it, they experience the language they just picked and then they make a discerning decision next time. They have, they have to have six weeks, six months, six years to learn vocabulary. They're not going to be good at anything in six minutes. 
but we do have to use our, like what would almost feels like common sense now because we've been doing it for so long. But when you work with people who haven't done this before, they, they default to this, find this, find that, find this, find that. And it's like, mm, let's, let's back up a minute. And just because you looked at it doesn't necessarily mean everything, right? Just like direct select, frank, frankly, just because you touched it, it means you were wondering what that would say when I touched it. You know what I mean? And that's what you should be doing the very first time you're exposed to a communication devices. What does this one say? What does this one do? Right? Um, and what Whitney was talking about too is those sensory games, they so much help you get in the positioning down. I one of the one of the most the probably the most um impactful training I ever did in my whole career was I went to adaptive switch lab in Texas and learned about seating and positioning and speech pathologists don't learn about it. And, um, we need to with all these complex bodies. And, um, you know, if, if I have a student whose vision is so low that their head is always down because that is their listening position and it's very unnatural for them to lift their head up, we're probably not doing eye gaze. I don't want to have to put a you know, apparatus on their neck to make them, make them lift their head. You know what I mean? It's like, let's let them be in the position that they feel good in. A lot of times people fall into that problem where they'll say, well, I, I want them to sit up straight. So we're going to mount the eye gaze device in the middle of the, de in, in, but they, but they lean left. And now we've decided that in order to communicate, they have to, you work their core constantly, you know, but I don't, but that's, that's the piece about any direct, any system is, is um, figuring out how do you do that um, critical thinking around evaluation versus testing. Yeah. And I, like, as you were talking about, um, like responding to what they're giving us, it's like that total communication. So it's like someone who comes to us, who's completely nonverbal, has never used an AA system, AAC system before. What are they doing? They're using their, they're just normal eye gaze they're using mm -hmm. their emotions they're using their their body language and so yes having to see those things as they're communicating that's their their total communication and so mm -hmm. yeah and so same goes with trying to figure out number of buttons for scanning auditory right 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 and i think I've, i felt like i learned a lot from linda burkhart and still from that as far as like that pe people learn the auditory order of, of, of something on a page and not to mess up that order because they are, especially if they're two-step scanning, they know it's the third one down. So don't mess that up. Right. Um, and it's so interesting. One of the videos that I have was this boy who, um, when we met him, he was one years old and my, and the vision was super poor. Like she, he was, um, he didn't open his eyes very much. And when he did, it didn't, there wasn't a lot of, um, of visual recognition. Like we, you know, so we put him on switches and the very first time in two head switches, one, head, one switch, he's listening to his choices and the other switch he's hitting when he hears the one he wants and, um, he could do it. And he was one. And the very first time we were like, this is a switch, here we go. And um, so sometimes I I get a little bit nervous when I'm going to talk to a family about switch access because it seems so hard and complicated and old school, right? Because we have this high-tech tech technology, mm -hmm. but it it's very much often the right fit for the age, mm -hmm. for the for the vision, for the motor skills, however you whatever you're looking for. So the, I, I feel like, um, but even then it's like, how much, how many things can a one-year-old hear and then choose from what would be the normal development on that? No cognitive delay at all, right? What's, what's the, what's that? We don't have a ton of data on that, but you can, it, even if we did, it wouldn't serve the kiddo well to not take your own data. This kid really can only hear six things or he's just going to pick, he's going to pick one because it's too long to wait or whatever, or they're, cause they're not doing, you know, row column yet or however that goes. I, I was not doing row column with meaning he's clicking the switch to go down to the row and then clicking the switch to go over to the column at one years old, you know, <laughs> you know, um, with not enough vision to even see a row or a column, column, by the way. So I, it's just like when, it, no matter what you're doing, um, 
either with eye gaze or direct select or um, auditory preview, you're seeing like what's their what's their um, their sweet spot of this is how much input they can handle and be accurate. And they can do that for 30 minutes, not five minutes, right? right. Or whatever you decide, like, because it's like, this is, if this can't happen all day, which most alternative access cannot happen all day, um, it, they need um, visual breaks, they need physical breaks, they need to get out of their chair, they need to get out of their position that it requires. And so we have to have realistic expectations about um, how and when, of course, the, you know, the, it's we need to access language all the time is 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 something that we that is the privilege to say in with someone who has no other um seating and positioning issues but the rest of them need breaks and um we have to be realistic about that and listen to your ot your pt your vision person around all those like hey hey if you tax the system he's going to hate this thing you know mm -hmm. when you both mentioned that um the idea of kind of like having motivating vocabulary, having something motivating to say, because it is a lot of work for a one-year-old to step scan, right? To get what he wants or for a student um, with low vision to coordinate that, to find that vocabulary that they're looking for. So it does need to be motivating. It needs to be something they're interested in, whether it's the songs, but it's songs appropriate to them, right? Or if it's a song, but instead of playing it on your phone, you're making it really um, the sensory experience by touching them, their hands and singing it yourself, right? Whatever that is, that's motivating for the student. So can I share a little story? Because you were talking about it, Brenda, um, yeah. about maybe switch access and scanning being somewhat old school. Like I only have on my caseload, like two scanners right now and one yeah. I've known for 13 years and she was a scanner when I met her just it was completely automatic scanning um row column and just the one switch and so throughout the years she's went from so she uses PRC device so she went she calls it her dinosaur and this always kills me and it was like the vanguard <laughs> just really yep. chunky back in the day yeah. now she's got like the sleek accent yeah um, but she went from 45 buttons to 84 within the time that I've known her. Um, wow. But she is such a um, motor planner and that's yeah. what those pages are all about. And it's right. so crazy to see her go from just that one switch auto row column. And now she's two step or two switch step scanning and like mm -hmm. quarter, like, ha you know, mm -hmm. the quarter of her. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. And we have tried eye gaze multiple times because you know, family was interested in it. Um, mm. She had an eye surgery. Um, and so like one, they would always tell me one of her eyes um, was for far and one was for near. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what she's seeing. She right. up from 45 to 84. Um, Which I would I even calibrate this to. Yeah, yeah, we tried multiple times, multiple different companies, vendors, you know, just to sure. make sure. And it's like, she's still rocking it and she is doing, she has her motor pattern. So yeah. we switched to that, you know? And so, yeah, no, that's kind of a success story of like not knowing vision, um, but keeping your system and just making that system more robust as you go and not being stuck in those 45 because you know, those, you know, right. You know so well, like, I don't care what age you are. You're, I think she was probably 28 when we switched to that, you know, so okay, it's never yeah. too late to give more language. So yeah, yeah, that's always a fun one. You know, when I started my career in Seattle, um, I worked at United Cerebral Palsy and it was like in the nineties and, um, eye gaze wasn't a thing. So everybody used switch switches. And I feel like now all these little peanuts that are coming out of school um, so they're like, why would you ever do switches? That's super hard. And let's just do, I guess for everyone. And I'm like, oh no, we like, I, that's why I say that people think that's old school, but, but it's like, no, you, if you have witnessed, you know, 50, um, scan successful switch access scanners, it right off the bat, then you do not 
um, rule that out just because the technology can let you do more because you're right. If your body is able to figure out those motor plans, then the cognitive load is pretty low on being able to do it. Just like you come to the keyboard and you put your fingers at ASDF, it doesn't even matter what all that, where all those letters are. If somebody threw it on a keyboard that said ABC order, you'd be like, call me. I can't even figure this out right now. So if you have a person that gravitates towards that motor planning piece and you, once they get it down, they, they are, they could be faster on switches than they are on eye gaze and they could have, or they could have access to more language that way than their vision allows on eye gaze. And so it, it definitely is, I feel like something that we need as, um, as mentors or as people um, that have been doing this a while, it's our job to let um, younger, newer SLPs who are very tech savvy understand the reality is um, switch access is still a very um, promising access method for those with low vision. And who knows what it's going to look like in five years. But yeah, no, when I, I just out of grad school, I worked at Provail and, and same thing. They have a ton of patients with cerebral palsy and I guess was just starting to maybe be a thing yeah. I have a device there. Wait, nope. I didn't do that until shoot five, six, seven years later, but I'm so glad that I had that access to all these things and these low tech options and that experience. Cause I feel like if I didn't, it would have biased me for sure. And so, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't feel that old, but I'm like, yeah, for these newbies coming out, I'm like, yeah, yeah. we got to take it back old school, but yeah, no, well, I know. Forget is that. there any eye gaze device you guys know of that doesn't have the ability to have switches with it? Yep. They all, no. You can do it with switches on every device. So that's just showing that yeah. people just need multiple methods. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good point. And at least in Washington state, they only fund one access method, but we have lots of different, you know, um, foundations and, and things like that to get money for switches. You know what I mean? So I always keep that in mind too, of like, we could do both and yeah. Yeah, sometimes you sometimes you fund the eye gaze and then you figure out ways to get some switches so that they that because switches are cheaper than the eye gaze yeah. bar kind of thing. So you kind of play the game because the people reviewing don't understand the the complexity of this body and that alternative act and multiple ways to commute to access the device is required. Yeah. Well, and that's your your job along with your team and you you guys do it well, I know. Whitney, what resources can you think of that might be helpful for our audience listening in today? So this was something um, accidental that I stumbled upon when I was Googling a certain diagnosis because clearly we get a lot and now genetic testing is really big and we have all these syndromes and different things, but it was Chiari malformation. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, no idea what this is. How does it affect the body? How does it affect the vision? Um, so on my research, this was probably five, six years ago, I found this gal named Veronica Lewis. I don't know if you guys have heard her, but she mm -hmm. has a like Pinterest, but also her um, her website is Veronica with four eyes, like V-E-R-O-N-I-I-I-I, -I -I -I, or did I say three or four, but dot com, but four eyes. What do you call someone who has glasses? And so I, oh my gosh, uh, I love her. She, she has Chiari malformation and, and low vision and... Um, other things. And so she, um, the, how I stumbled upon it, um, was one of the very first Pinterest, like pins I saw of hers was like, how to make your iPad more accessible. Um, and not even for AAC, but just like her as a college student. Um, and so, and then I just kind of went down the rabbit hole of just like looking at all of her posts, um, and on her web website and her story. So I really liked that. Just a, a lot of things about like accommodations in the classroom for low vision learners. Um, just a bunch of things that I just didn't know about, you know, because I'm not in the classroom. Like I, I get to do a lot of school consults, but it's me zooming in to see the classroom. So I don't get to like physically be there a lot of the time. Resources coming from someone who has low vision and that. that's the Let best. Be we'll definitely mm -hmm. put that in our, our show notes. Was there anything else you wanted to share? Yeah, no, one that I was curious about was like the first steps the family could take. And I don't know, like I normally get them. So I was just, this is more just a question for you guys, I guess. Like, what are the first steps if you're one of the first people who sees someone who has low vision? I mean, most of the time when I see them, they're already in early intervention or already have like a TBI or something. So mm -hmm. 
I don't know that one. You know, I was just having a conversation with a parent who who has a diff- different story. So their child did not have a disability, you know, and it was an acquired disability a little bit later. And so they didn't get the early intervention services. And she was like, you know what? I didn't get, I did, people didn't tell me about the services that were available. And I didn't, I, you know, my kid was in school already. I didn't have any outside agencies. The schools were like, I don't know what, I don't know what you do, you know? And, um, and again, this is acquired like through an accident. And so it was like, we don't know about the vision and, you know, we have not lived at any minute in the world of disability until right this minute. So I do feel like first steps for people who have congenital issues or have uh, are born with a low vision, a known low vision, those people get a lot of support and they get some resources right off the bat. I feel like when, if, if vision declines, you know, if it's a later onset of low vision or if it's um, an acquired vision loss due to an accident, there, there's, there, those families seem to be um, swimming upstream. So I was wondering that same thing. I feel like that is um, an area that our field needs to get better at is um, making sure that um, what, if you, if you didn't get flagged in birth to three, then no matter when you show up in this system, um, here is the handbook that you never got. Well, I think part of that is, um, on the other hand, that we're so lucky that with school, early intervention and school services, children often have all these supports. And then when you're older, the the support looks a lot different. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I'm thinking outside of school when they've aged out of school. Oh, um, I know. And if you have if you're entering the world of disability at that age, um, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first steps that I would recommend for parents that have a child where they're like, I don't think they're, they can see me is obviously to, to get more information. And the other thing is, is I would say, take your own observational data. So you were told your child's blind, but they watch the dog watch, walk across the room. You know, um, because I have gone in to legally blind paperwork, you know, I, the paperwork says legally blind, the kiddo can, and they can do direct select on a 60 button. So I don't know. I don't know why that is. But um, so I would say that no matter what, I, first steps is to get a diagnosis. And the second step, step is to use your own observational skills to refine what does that diagnosis mean for my kiddo? For my child. And this is what I'm seeing. True. Whitney, what are some things that you're looking at when you're talking to parents? Because that's a good point, Brenda. So much of the information comes from the observations that either you have in the sessions, but you have such um, a limited amount of time with them compared to family who's been with them for so long. What are some things that you're looking for or asking about when you're talking to parents and thinking about vision or language too? Kind of like what you were saying, Brenda, just like observations from the home. Like, are they tracking you? Like, are they, is it just because they're hearing your voice or, you know, do they, if you open up the blinds, do they, you know, just different, because we don't know what it's like in the home. And so just some of those observations in the home environment versus what I'm going to see when I see them in a clinic environment, because those environments are are so vastly different. Um, Along those lines of just like, if someone is learning language, but with different eyes, like pun intended. Um, what are some of the things that you would do for typical early intervention versus like speech for someone who has low vision? And so one right. of the things that I have like a family that they do um, is the mom says everything that she's doing. She does that self-talk. And it's like, you, like you, again, you assume that competence. So like of, of her vision and of her language, like maybe we don't know what she's seeing, but mom's like, yep, we're doing this now. And I'm going to button up my shirt and then we're going to pull up my pants, you know, learning that vocabulary, but also like pointing out what she's doing. So she's learning the movements of like, yeah, I can't see that mom's doing that because again, I get some paperwork and it says, to, you know, 24 inches, two feet is like all she can see, but like mom's standing up and she's over there, you know, getting dressed and she's paying attention to her. So it's just, yeah, some of those observations and things like that within an environment where I don't get to see them to help me know when I'm seeing them in the clinic. So mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Mm -hmm. one of the best um, parenting I've seen with a child that um, just had no vision at all. I don't, I don't, I don't even think he he did not have eyeballs. Like he was born without eyes. And mom was so good about what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it, she, it wasn't because um, she was like, oh, maybe he'll now attach his vision to my words. Mm-hmm. She's just actually letting him know that things are happening all around you all of the time. And he was acutely listening. And so he probably has some pretty, incre- he was also one years old, not yet two, but his receptive language skills seemed pretty spot on as, as the dog would bark and mom would talk and this and that. And, and, you know, he seemed like he, because of his no, because he's not distracted by trying to figure out how to process visual information, his um, hearing and his processing of all the things that she was saying was so in tune. And I'm always in awe at the parents that just seem to almost naturally do that. You're like, oh my gosh, where'd you, like, again, the kid is, the kid's not even two. So the mom's hasn't been doing this a hot minute. You know what I mean? Like it's, 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 she's still learning, but she was so good about, you know, and then it's like, oh, do you, I don't know if you hear that, but the fries are crackling because I'm frying something right now or whatever. And she's just constantly, you know, um, narrating things that he's probably hearing and I was just like in awe of that skill. Yeah, well, um, for all of our kids, right? Um, right. Typically developing kids, typical kids of typical vision, that is something that we talk to, to parents about doing, right? Mm-hmm. That is that is a good skill to, to do that. That's neat. Yeah, just for their receptive language skills alone. Right. Well, Whitney, thank you so much. It's been such a joy to have you on our podcast today and talk to us about your experiences with AAC evaluations and students with low vision. We really enjoyed it. Thanks for all your input. Thank you.